My name's Alex, I'm 24 years old. Uh, I've lived in Bristol um, almost all my life, although I did spend three years in Birmingham as a student. Um, and I am uh, on the Sovereign Housing Association Youth Panel. Um, when I was asked to host this meeting, I was asked to think about why I am so invested in fighting climate change. Obviously, it's a huge issue that affects all of us, but I was asked to think about what specifically, what specific events caused me to start thinking about, you know, the need to tackle climate change. And I was having a really hard time doing it. Um, and I realized the reason why was because as far back as I can remember, I was aware of climate change. I knew what was happening. I knew it was a thing. I think it's one of the burdens of, of my generation is that we are acutely aware for a long time that climate change is this huge issue. And it's so ubiquitous in our life um, that you know, it really has just become this kind of overarching shadow. Um, and it really colors all the decisions that I've made throughout my life in terms of the food I eat and the clothes I wear and where I travel and how I travel and also future decisions. Things like, you know, um, do I pay into this pension pot? Um, you know, do I have kids, things like that. Things that earlier generations may not have actually considered. I have to start thinking about what the implications are for the future. So that's been something that's kind of been throughout my life, but it was only when I got a little bit older that I started to sort of see the links between the climate crisis that we're facing and the social crisis that we're also facing and how those social inequities and the climate inequities that we see are kind of inherently linked. Um, like I said before, I was a student in Birmingham. I lived there for three years. I lived in the same house the whole time, the same student house. And anyone who's lived in, been a student and lived in student housing knows that typically they're not great. They're not the, you know, the best houses on the market. And um, like many houses in the private rental sector, um, they can be cold and damp and their energy efficiency ratings are not great. And mine was, was exactly like that. And um, there were most, you know, the three winters that I was there, I had to make difficult decisions in terms of, do I heat the house properly or do I kind of, you know, buy something slightly nice for myself to eat? And while I was making those decisions, I was also acutely aware of the fact that the more I heated my home, which was poorly insulated and allowed all this heat, the worse the impact was gonna be for the climate. Um, so, you know, experiences like that and the fact that I know so many young people who have experienced things like that makes it pretty, you know, reasonable why so many young people are so radical about climate change. And I think a lot of the kind of um, radicalism that you see in young people about climate change is rooted in anger, a lot of it, um, anger at sort of the situation that's been dumped on us from, from birth, but also it's rooted in hope as well. And that's kind of the key point for this event, I think, is that there is still hope. People who say that, you know, we've run out of time and there's no time to do anything, I mean, there's no evidence really to back that up, but there is hope and there is still time to do stuff. And that's why events like this um, are so important. So this uh, person is a green councillor for Bishopston and Ashley Down, um, one of the UK's youngest councillors, um, Lily Fitzgibbon. So Lily. Hiya. Yes, so that is me. And today I was asked to talk a bit about my own experiences with climate justice, climate activism, as well as my experiences in politics, um, because I started off as a young activist before I made the switch to become elected in Bishopston. And the thing that really motivated my passion for activism was similar to what you were talking about, actually, is that I felt a really overwhelming sense of helplessness. And I think a lot of young people feel this. I think, I believe it's been polled that 60% of young people feel extremely worried about the climate crisis, with another 45% saying that they think that affects them every day of their lives in their day-to-day -day activities. And I know that I was certainly one of those people. Um, it's not just a sense of helplessness, it's a sense that the people who could perhaps help aren't doing what they could be doing. Um, and as well as this idea of an intergenerational burden, we were born into this situation, into this crisis, with people who are much older than us, having not had to live the same way that we do, carrying this burden. And now we are asked to come together to solve it, and to some people that feels very inequitable. So for me, the solution to alleviating some of this anxiety was activism, because the more that I felt I was personally doing, the less I was spending my days sitting around worrying. Um, but 
that's not the solution for everyone. And so I really want to speak to more young people and hear from more young people about what they can do to make themselves feel a little bit better about living in the world that we do. Okay, so um, I walked out from uh, my home, Hebden Bridge, to London to, to try and raise awareness for uh, a, a carbon tax. I uh, supported the Zero Carbon Campaign's petition to, to try and get it to 100,000 signatures. And I was debated by a, a special committee of MPs. And, um, uh, and, and the, reason that I, I, the reason I did this is because as I had a sense of optimism. I really could do something, but I can make. I could make a change, and, and uh, I. So initially, I just became, I was really worried. I read read a lot about climate change. I thought people weren't paying enough attention to, to a carbon tax, which I think is really important because it would it make companies that emit lots of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases to pay for what they emit, which would encourage them to switch to green or renewable options, and. Um, I also heard about peat burning on the moors was near where I live, which was um, just uh, just so that people can uh, and just so that grass can have a mixture of old and new heather, so that people can shoot them. And so I did a small protest in my square against that, and I met a uh, like I met a restaurant owner who was who served grouse. and uh, he said that he always thought that grouse was like a, a sustainable option option because it was free range and he'd, he'd never considered that, that, it, that, um, that people might, might burn the, the moors which draw lots of carbon di the, uh, carbon dioxide in them um, to uh, uh, have a grouse live there and so he stopped serving uh, grouse on his menu and that really gave me a sense of optimism that I can achieve things and so I decided that well, something that would have a really big impact that I could actually achieve would be walking to London. I did it in 21 days. I did about 11 miles a day, and and uh, well, I just I actually really enjoyed the experience of 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 doing it. It really made me feel you know, hopeful as I was doing it. Doing it. Yes, I knew that every step I took would be a, be a step closer to my goal of getting a carbon tax introduced in this country and also of under this country's leadership getting, getting countries across the world to introduce carbon taxes at COP26 and I'm still really hopeful that we'll, that we'll do that. One, uh, I'm Sophie. I'm Pim. I'm Matty. Um, we're part of the Avon Schools Eco Network, and that is a regional. What Pim can tell you. Um, well, as Avon Schools Eco Network, we're also part of the UK SSN, um, and as far as we know, we are the only group of UK schools who are actually um, together, and we also have been invited to the Home Office to attend meetings, and um, some of our students, such as Matty. Um, and Sophie have been to COP26 and actually had stands there and as part of Students of Home team um, we were in charge of increasing student engagement and awareness for COP26 because surprisingly a lot of students don't actually know about it and don't actually know about the action that is trying to be taken so kind of linked to what Lily was saying was that trying to decrease the climate anxiety by taking climate action. So um, some of the people that we met at COP were, um, yeah, so uh, there were 20 students uh, from the National UK School Sustainability Network, of which we're a part, that went to COP26. And um, we all met lots of different peop people. Uh, so we um, appeared in high profile live streams on the UK government panels and on Good Morning Britain. Uh, we were also in meetings with the Secretary of State for Education, and we even had a drop in from the President of COP26 and Minister of State Alok Sharma. Uh, you might have seen there's a video of us talking to him and with a uh, picture of us holding up one of our T-shirts uh, with him. Um, so we were on the UN Youth Envoy for Climate Change and the Joint General Secretary of the National Education Union. Uh, we we're also part of the youth delegates from Nigeria and Nepal meetings. Uh, and we also met with the president of Costa Rica and, interestingly enough, Bear Grylls. Yeah. 
Um, and that's just a few of the better ones among the many interviews that were performed um, in COP26. Um, so I was part of the Green Zone team, which was displaying our two stands that we had, one of which was in collaboration with People Power, writing letters to your, MP, to your MPs and um, engaging the public to do that, which we've now sent. And um, the stand that I was mostly on was in collaboration with UCEL, and we were demonstrating these very cool toy um, hydrogen powered cars um, to the public. So we would show them charge us charging the car and then plugging it in and, and setting it going and explain a bit about hydrogen, how hydrogen power is a good um, storage of energy system as long as you get the energy from the right places, which was, of course, very interesting. Yeah, the, um, the, the letter writing to MPs, we also had on that stand a form that me and Sophie had sent out to our schools, mm -hmm. uh, which had uh, a range of responses all the way from year seven through to year 13. So your 11 year olds to your 18 year olds, uh, all about COP26, hydrogen power, um, and basically just gauging how much young people know on the topic. And uh, we, it was all done on a lovely Google form which showed a lovely range of spread and data, uh, which that was actually part of the, uh, what Sophie explained to Alok Sharma when he came around. Um, mm. The letter writing to MPs got a lot of people engaged from all walks of life. We had, uh, I think the youngest person who had a letter was about six or seven, uh, all the way up to uh, quite elderly people writing these letters because at the end of the day, it's something that affects all of us. And uh, it doesn't matter how old you are, it, it will affect you at some point in your life or it will have done. Um, so yeah, that was our, um, that was our um, stand with people power and our experience with them in yeah. the green zone. And um, we think it was really important that we were there because even though a lot of people can be quite pessimistic, especially about youth voice at COP26, I think it's always good to think, well, you know, we have improved, we have got somewhere because, you know, in, in previous meetings, there wouldn't have been any youth voice there at all. And especially not in the blue zone, um, talking to ministers where we had where we had three students on the Friday. Um, and so although it can be quite easy to be pessimistic sometimes, I think it's always good to just keep a really um, hopeful uh, up outlook and just keep on trying for it. Otherwise, we'll never get anywhere. I so, think yeah. I think the Twitter comments and things like and social media comments that people left on not only our posts but as high up as Good Morning Britain and BBC's uh, retweets of us just showed how much people think that it doesn't affect young people. It's not their issue to deal with, which obviously, as we all know here, that's not the case. It affects it affects us. It affects all of you guys as well, you guys on Zoom. And people are so naive when it comes to this topic and ignorant to the fact that. It's, it's our future and it's right that we have a say in our own future and I hope like we all hope that you guys agree with that so yeah so, um, thank you very much for listening to us and I think we'll just leave on the fact that it was an absolute honor to go to COP26 and be able to represent you know both the students of Bristol and also of the rest of the UK at COP26 so thank you for having us thank you very much thank you Hello, I'm Leah. Um, thank you very much for having me here today. We have been asked to talk about our personal experiences, so I wonder if I will just um, maybe repeat a lot of what has been said, but I think that will, that will display like our, our shared passion. Um, but I am I'm a member of Youth Parliament for Bristol, and I consider myself uh, a climate activist. And I am so passionate about saving our planet. It feels like a force inside me and a drive that comes from so much more than me. I feel like I must make a change. And I'm sure that I'm in a room today with people that feel exactly the same way, but it doesn't always feel like that. And sometimes I feel like I ask the question, why doesn't everyone feel the same as me? But on reflection, I have a very privileged perspective I'm educated and I'm from a good home. I don't have to think about how I put food on the plate. So I get the opportunity to choose what I put on my plate. Um, but 
there are still privileged people who don't care about the planet. And that's actually the whole problem. So thinking about what to say today has been a nice opportunity to reflect on my personal journey with fighting for climate justice and where it all comes from. Firstly, I think I'm so passionate because of my family. Both my parents are political activists, so conversations like this have always been in my household. And because I have such close role models, I've been able to take it um, upon myself to get involved and learn more. So I joined the Bristol City Youth Council three years ago. Um, and I've been to many climate events and movements. And I think since then, my drive for change has climbed because I've been surrounded by people who also care. And I've been able to learn so much by being in such political and empowering environments. And I've reflected what's around me. I do feel scared and I do feel very angry about the current present and future of our planet. And this shapes all my personal decisions. I'm vegan and I only buy secondhand clothes. I'm involved in new politics and I've missed a lot of school now for climate strikes. And I've realized that actually making these personal changes is empowering. I have to do it. It helps me cope with the fear and the anger. My personal changes gives me hope and motivation because it feels like I'm making a change. So then change is possible. Hope is so important. And I think it may be the most important emotion in this revolution. I understand, of course, that most do not have the privilege to consider personal changes. The, the effects of climate crisis are ones of great disparity and the solutions to climate crisis are ones of deep intersectionality. And it must be that regardless of your race, class, ability, or gender, that you have a choice to live sustainably and make decisions ethically. No community can be left behind as we embark on this fight for humankind. Right now is COP26. A big one, maybe, but that's not where my hope lies. And as Greta said, the change won't come from in there. It will come from out here. And the people that are not COP26, I think that we are the change and we are the passion. And it's being at events like these that remind me of the power in the people and the passion in the collective that is a powerful tool and maybe a force that is strong enough to overturn this capitalist rule. So I think if there's one thing that I'd like for you to come away from hearing me speak, and if there's one thing that I've learned from listening to others speak and fighting for climate justice, it is that we've got to keep the pressure up and we can't give up hope. The more people digging at the roots, the quicker we can uproot this system. It's not going to be an easy journey, but we have to believe it has a happy ending. Thank you.